right, hello everyone. Welcome to The Current, the North Central Region's uh, Speed Networking Webinar Series. My name is Ann Nardi and I am the Marketing Communication Specialist for the North Central Region Water Network. And we're excited to be bringing you uh, this month's edition of The Current on grazing, livestock, and water resource management. We have a great uh, lineup of speakers set up for you today. A few housekeeping items just to get started. Everyone who entered as a participant is muted, so no need to worry about any feedback issues. Uh, we will facilitate the Q&A through the chat. So the chat box is accessible via the purple Collaborate panel in the lower right-hand corner of your webinar screen. And there will be a dedicated Q&A session following the last presentation that I will facilitate. So feel free to enter your questions there for our speakers as we go along. If you are having any issues with audio, we do uh, suggest using Chrome um, as your um, internet browser of choice if you are having any issues. There also is a phone-in option that can be accessed if uh, you're having any internet issues. Uh, that can be accessed by opening the session menu in the upper left-hand area of the webinar screen and selecting the use phone by audio option. Uh, also, we want to make you aware that this webinar is being recorded and we will post the recording on our website, northcentralwater.org and eExtension, learn at eExtension.org, as well as the PowerPoint slides. So you will be able to access that afterwards. Uh, for those of you who may not be aware, the North Central Region Water Network is a 12 state partnership of extension land grant universities. Um, within the North Central region. So all the way from uh, North Dakota down to Kansas, over to Missouri, Ohio, and Michigan. Uh, however, we have from all across the region uh, to, this, to this webinar series. And the idea behind it is as a speed networking webinar series. So we're gonna have three speakers today and each are gonna talk for roughly 10 minutes. So it's just to give you kind of an overview or a, a glimpse into their work. Um, and provide some information for you to follow up with them later should you want to uh, find out more about their work or increase their connectivity that way. So our speakers for today, we have um, Dr. Sandy Smart, who is a professor and extension rangeland management specialist from South Dakota State University. We have Jane Jouette from the Greenlands Blue Waters, which is based at the University of Minnesota. And we also have Danny hessler Woodill from uh, the Valley Stewardship Network, which is in um, southwestern Wisconsin. Um, so each of these presenters are going to be talking about grazing, livestock, and water resource management, though a little bit of a different um, approach to each. Uh, Sandy talking a little bit more about research. Jane going over uh, some of her educational efforts through Greenland's Blue Water. And Danny talking about some of her uh, outreach efforts within the watershed that she's been working in with the Valley Stewardship Network. So excited to feature all three of them. So with that, we will uh, have Sandy get us started here. Uh, on the screen, you'll see a brief bio about as mentioned. Sandy is uh, a professor at South, Deca South Dakota State University and also an extension rangeland management specialist. And he's gonna be talking about some of his research out in um, Western South Dakota regarding um, great impact on streams and some of the implications that might have in other parts of the of the Midwest. So I won't read this whole bio for you, but I'll let you review that. And we are excited to have Sandy here talking with us. So with that, Sandy, I'll hand it off. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for joining this afternoon. <clears throat> I just got off of uh, teaching a habitat class online, so it was a kind of an interesting quick turnaround. Uh, with a different audience. But what I want to talk about today is uh, a basically an idea that presented itself um, with a student that I had a number of years ago that was uh, doing some remote sensing work for me and uh, uh, and just lend itself an opportunity to, to look at these um, optimal placement of off-stream water sources for ephemeral stream recovery. So um, this is basically his work, and let's see, to air, oh, next slide, okay. So I, um, again, a, a lot of you are from some of the states that are, are centering around the Mississippi River Valley and, and some of those other areas. The folks that are from states in the Great Plains, um, North Dakota, South Dakota, 
uh, Nebraska, Kansas is, you know, this will this will have kind of resonate with you. So uh, this is probably a, a common uh, picture that you might see uh, where you would have uh, kind of intensive livestock grazing. This is for us in eastern South Dakota. This is uh, something that takes place quite frequently where we would have the, the, the ground that's not suited for cultivation that was left um, near water bodies, that it's going to be that pasture where you had that typical um, 50 head of that 58 year old uh, um, male that was was ranching on the side or farming or you know having livestock on the side and so these water bodies um, have unlimited access by these livestock uh, during the summertime and they get you get a lot of nutrient loading and uh, you know it turns into something like this there are of course solutions to this and uh, this is a, a photo that I took um, where somebody put this into a CP30. So this is that um, continual conservation reserve program sign up where you can get, take this, you know, area that's next to a water body and, and put it into a, a permanent uh, CRP and get paid something that would be approximating, you know, like a, a grazing rental rate. Um, and, and so there are some solutions that, um, you know, provide uh, to enhance this water quality by, you know, not having grazing access to this. Now, that's not always the case, you know, where, where people can afford to do this, but especially for a lot of ab absentee landowners, you know, this is some, this is a, an attractive alternative. For people that, uh, and I know John Lentz, you'll recognize um, uh, Rick Smith here on this photo. Uh, this uh, is a nose pump uh, where, you know, a, maybe a herd of a size of 50 or less could basically train themselves to to um, access this water that, so basically the, the they put in um, a tube where they can, um, you know, the gravel and the, and the water is nearby and they can access this to get water away from the stream. Um, there's rock crossings that can facilitate, you know, livestock crossings and not to hang around um, by these stream areas. But if you go out to Western uh, Dakota, so this is uh, 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 something that's probably out near Wall, South Dakota. If you've ever driven I-90 and saw the wall drug signs, uh, this is the mixed grass prairie. And we're talking about wide open spaces, you know, uh, pasture sizes, you know, much larger than a thousand acres and, uh, you know, water points that are pretty far away. And we do have um, some major rivers and we have some smaller uh, streams that, uh, you know, feed into those rivers that can um, decrease the water quality if you have livestock. So this is up, I think, um, near Lemon, South Dakota on the uh, uh, Forest Service land, but just a typical shot of the riparian area that you would have um, that would look nice and lush and green um, near the river and then, of course, the drier uplands. And so these are the main areas that you know, livestock would use and to try to protect these that we're using these off, off stream waters. And so it's typical you'd have these tire tanks, um, either a rural water um, that has ta uh, pipeline to these tanks, or it could be, a, you know, a well that they would be using, but uh, you'd have, have a, a larger herd using these type of, of tank systems. So what we did is we actually looked at the Forest Service land just south of Wall, South Dakota, and they had a couple of pastures where they implemented um, some off-stream, um, some uh, water practices to improvement practices, and that would be, you know, adding livestock tanks and doing some cross fencing to try to um, pull the cattle away from those streams. There's lots of data that show that cattle would prefer to drink out of a livestock tank than, than going into a, a dugout or a, a dam or reservoir, those kind of things. And maybe a stream too, if it's not flowing pretty fast. So that means that they're, they're enticed to do that. And we know that those practices would work. So what we did essentially is looked at um, remote se uh, sensing imagery, um, the NDVI, which is the greenness index, to look bef uh, prior to when the practices were installed and then after the practices were install, installed to look to see if there was a difference in the greenness index um, 
from these from these areas. <clears throat> so what we did is we looked in the, inside the channel um, prior to the um, off stream water practices, and then we looked um, looked at post that. So the the circles represent um, the dark circles represent the NDVI um, in in channel vegetation. Um, and that's the distance on the x-axis up to the off-stream water source. And then the diamonds are pre. So you can see that prior to the uh, cross-fencing and adder water, water tanks, that uh, they were, um, the NDVI of the in-channel stream vegetation was lower. So what, and then afterwards it was higher. So meaning that they probably, it probably worked effectively to entice them away from the in-stream and they didn't graze in, the, in that area and, and chew that vegetation down so it was showing uh, greener. And then if you look at the upland vegetation, it's actually kind of the opposite. So then they're um, grazing on the upland um, post uh, the, the water practice. And, um, and, and, and so there's less veg, there's greener vegetation before that because they were spending more time on the riparian and less on the upland. And so it was just the opposite. But what the, the interesting thing that we noticed was the distance from water that at about 250 meters, you see that the pre and the post were about the same. So what this told us is that you need to, you need to pre, uh, place your water tank about 250 meters away from the stream because you, we know that, that they, they concentrate their grazing around the water tank. And if that water tank is right next to the stream, then they're gonna you know, graze the stream area um, you know, hard as well. So you want to make sure that you place that that 250 meters away. If it's too far away, then it's too far to walk to, and then they'll just graze. You know, they'll use the stream to uh, to water out of, and they'll graze that vegetation. Of course, when you do that, um, you can develop these things called pyospheres. And basically, with that picture in the lower right, um, you're going to get a denuded area where the cattle are going to spend time and uh, you know graze down those areas so you just have to be careful of where you place these water tanks so that it's not on a steep hillside or on soils that are prone to erosion uh, whether that could be wind or rain erosion because you know that you're going to have these sacrifice areas where you put these uh, water tanks so we were able to identify these these impacts of these pyospheres on the landscape so basically, we found that these off-stream water practices, the tanks, the fencing, did shift the grazing pressure away from those in-channel areas. And we're assuming that the vegetation um, function of those uh, was returned and to increase the uh, water quality of those streams. We know that the pyospheres develop around those water tanks, and that's something that's unavoidable. So it's important to, to be careful where you place them. And then we noticed that um, you want to be within about 250 to 1,200 meters away from that stream. If you place it too far, the cattle aren't going to want to walk to it, and they're going to use the stream. If it's too close, you know they're going to graze, um, you know, on that around that water tank and influence that stream. So that's the end of my quick presentation. Great, thank you so much, Sandy. And um, folks, uh, if you have questions for Sandy, please make sure and list them in the chat box. And after our other speakers, we will have some Q&A. Sandy's gonna stay on for that. So thank you very much. Switching gears a little bit here. Uh, next up is Jane Jouette. And Jane is the Associate Director and Coordinator of the Information Exchange Program at the Minnesota Institute of Sustainable Agriculture and also the Midwest Perennial Forage Working Group Coordinator at Greenlands Blue Waters, both located at the University of Minnesota. So um, Jane is going to be talking a little bit about some of the Midwest Perennial Forage Working Group's educational efforts when it comes to uh, forage and grazing and its impact on water quality and municipal infrastructure. Um, so I have her, her bio here for folks. Um, so Jane, please take it away. Thanks for joining us. All right, thank you. Uh, yep, so Greenlands Blue Waters is a multi-state um, research, education, and outreach consortium that involves land-grant universities and uh, some agency folks, state and federal agency, a bunch of nonprofit organizations. 
and it's centered in the upper Mississippi River Basin, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, and Missouri. And then we also include Louisiana in there because a major focus of Greenland's Blue Waters is trying to um, repair the hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And our, our team on Greenland's Blue Waters includes um, Eugene Turner and uh, his wife, Nancy Rabelais, who are the people who do the water sampling in the Gulf of Mexico every summer to determine the extent of the hypoxic zone. So they're part of our group. The Midwest Perennial Forage Working Group um, is one of our five strategies, and I'll get to that in a second. So here's the Greenland's Blue Waters homepage, part of it as it currently appears. And uh, there's a mission statement on there that I've got expanded on the next slide. So Greenland's Blue Waters is a vision for a profitable agriculture based on keeping the soil covered productively year round, farming with continuous living cover. And continuous living cover includes five main strategies that we talk about within that network agroforestry, perennial biomass, perennial forages and grazing, perennial grains, and then um, cover crops, including winter annuals in cover crops and in rotation with cash crops. So why continuous living cover? There's a longer explanation of it on the Greenland's Blue Waters website, but the kind of the heart of it is that continuous living cover means living roots in the ground all year round, all the time, every year. Um, so the farmland stays in production. We're not talking about set aside acres. We're making year round use of soil, nutrients, water, and solar resources. Continuous living cover farming introduces a greater diversity of crops and livestock. Uh, and some of the benefits are improved water quality, moderation of stream flow, soil health, uh, native wildlife habitat, and economic opportunities for farmers. So the goal of Greenland's Blue Waters is to see continuous living cover expand across agricultural landscapes. And then one aspect of Greenland's Blue Waters or one group operating under that umbrella is the Midwest Perennial Forage Working Group. Um, and we have a segment of the Greenland's Blue Web Blue Waters website with the URL listed there. So we have our own mission statement um, to facilitate an increase in the land used for pasture and perennial forage production in the upper Midwest and to improve the environmental performance of farming systems while maintaining agricultural production and profitability. And because we are the Midwest Perennial Forage Group, we think of that in terms of forage and grazing. So here's our geography. Um, our active members in the working group come from Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, and Missouri. And, um, it looks like the, the stars on those states got shifted just a little bit. I apologize for that. I put the slides in in the wrong um, format. I had them widescreen and, and had to switch it to standard view and that made the stars shift. Anyway, we have folks from all over the place. And our thematic focus in the working group is support for grazing educators. So we're all about perennial forage and grazing, um, but the way that we operate is supporting the grazing educators who have the direct one-on-one -on -one contact with farmers. Our working group does not deal um, directly with farmers. We're all about the grazing educators. And we've been around since 2011 with organizational support from Greenland's Blue Waters addressing that perennial forage strategy, which is just one of the five of continuous living cover. 
we've done a bunch of things that have um, been advised and supported and participated in by our working group members and that support grazing educators in their work. So the contract grazing fact sheets are, um, those were our first big project. And these are a set of support documents for educators who are working with landowners and um, livestock owners trying to connect them up because the landowners and the livestock owners don't have to be the same people. You can have contract grazing arrangements where the livestock people bring in the cows and the landowners um, provide the land and it can work out very well on both sides. Then we created the slide library for grazing educators. A bunch of our members um, put together these really great webinars to try to um, put out a consistent message about what grazing educators know and would like others to know, farmers to know and other educators to know about grazing and soil health and perennial forage. So we did this webinar series and then all of the slides from that were put onto their own PowerPoint files, one file per slide with proper credit. And then these are available on our website for anybody to download and drop into their own presentations. And this is the example I use because it's my favorite slide ever. The um, vast improvement in reduction of soil erosion from pasture as compared to other types of cropping systems. Uh, this slide was put together by Laura Payne, who at the time was with Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship. Uh, she's now with Grassland 2.0 at the University of Wisconsin, but she's still our co-chair for the working group. And then we had a project to look at a bunch of grazing dairies and do some pretty in-depth financial analysis of those in collaboration with the Center for um, Agricultural Profitability at the University of Wisconsin. And just a couple of key slides from, the, from that work. Um, we showed that the grazing dairies that we interviewed, uh, seven of them on average had higher net farm income per cow than the general dairy uh, farm financial profile that was in the AGFA uh, database. And we showed a little different pattern of costs and savings in dairy grazing farms versus all. Again, we had a really small sample size of seven farms, so I was happy that we could see anything at all. Uh, but this data, these charts, uh, there are a bunch more charts. There are some um, graphs of grazing patterns among the seven farms. These are being used on a weekly basis by some of the educators in our group. So it was a useful, um, useful project that supported those educators in their work. And that's what we always try to do. Another thing the group does is produce um, sessions at the Greenlands Blue Waters Conference. The most recent conference was in 2019, uh, all about continuous living cover farming. And the sessions arranged and, and co-sponsored by the Perennial Forage Group were these, uh, focused on ecosystem services markets to support grazing, uh, which is a really, big and complicated topic, but we um, we shined light in a bunch of corners of it during that conference. So it was a really useful gathering and a uh, set of discussions that we had. Some new activities that we have lined up. Uh, the Pasture Project, part of Windrock International, is work on a regenerative, regenerative grazing article that working group members are um, advising on. Midwest Grazing Exchange is something that's under development led by a couple of our working group members. Uh, the idea is to produce a multi-state 
database and matching service kind of of landowners and livestock owners. So again, facilitating those contract grazing relationships that can um, make more grazing happen in more areas if the livestock owners can get matched up with landowners who have um, forage ground or even crop residue ground or cover crop ground that's available to be grazed. So some states have their own grazing exchanges. We're not trying to supplant those, but to link them in and um, expand coverage to states that don't currently have their own. Uh, we're just beginning work on an infographic about the value of perennial forage in agricultural landscapes to um, improve water infiltration and redu reduce surface runoff and, and rapid surface water flow, which can protect road and bridge infrastructure. And then also um, highlighting the value of deep rooted perennial plants around um, drinking water protection, wellhead protection areas. So that will be an interesting project. And then also just getting started on um, seeking some funding and developing ideas around a widespread multi-state survey of brief beef producers to get a sense of the current um, state of the industry and what the interest might be in grazing. Uh, here's an example of Minnesota's grazing exchange. So that's an example of an exchange. And then the Midwest one would encompass, again, multiple states. And we also know that there are producers who are willing to truck their livestock quite a few miles to find good pasture. And so state lines are not necessarily a barrier to that movement of livestock. Again, perennial forage is just one piece of the comprehensive strategy for continuous living cover on agricultural lands. And we also have um, connections and communication with folks working in some of these other areas. Silvopasture is kind of a, a sixth strategy that has um, started to be talked about more within Greenland's Blue Waters, and that kind of straddles the agri and the um, perennial biomass, warm season grasses for biofuel also can be a source of forage. So we kind of straddle that world as well. Uh, so there's a lot of overlap and interaction among these strategies. And that's all I have. Thank you. Um, there's my contact information, and I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. Great, thank you so much, Jane. And now moving to our third presenter, uh, we're excited to have Danny Heisler Woodill here with us. Danny is the Regenerative Agriculture um, Outreach Coordinator with Valley Stewardship Network, and she lives in farms in the Tanner Creek watershed in Wisconsin. Um, Danny's going to be talking a little bit of a pivot from the educational efforts Jane overviewed into some of her outreach working with producers and uh, grazing within the Tanner Creek watershed. So, uh, Danny, with that, we'll hand it over to you. Thanks so much, and thank you all for inviting me to speak today. Um, not sure about the weather in everyone else's area, but it is raining here in our part of Wisconsin, and that is an awesome thing. So corn silage has been harvested, and we've got cover crops that have been planted and now we just needed that little bit of rain so pretty exciting day make the best out of the gloomy weather right so i'm danny heisler woodill and i work with valley stewardship network as the regenerative agriculture outreach coordinator um, so valley stewardship network is um, a nonprofit that's uh, based in viroqua wisconsin in the heart of the driftless region um, we do much of our work um, surrounding Viroqua, but we do work across a, a multi-county effort. Uh, the VSN was established in 2000, so we've got our, our 20 year anniversary this year. Um, and we've been 
um, focused on kind of three three specific areas. Um, water quality research, as that's one component that I'll, I'll mention a little bit later. Um, youth and community outreach and education. And then stewardship assistance, which is generally that's where my role falls into, into the work that we do. Um, so all of our work is grant funded. And um, a lot of what I do is um, a support staff for our, our Tainer Creek uh, Farmer-Led Watershed Council, um, facilitating communication, um, kind of facilitating our meetings, events, and outreach activity, um, planning that, and, and then the implementation, and assisting with on-farm uh, research, and then providing technical resources. Um, and uh, I guess coordinating with our partners also, as we'll kind of talk a little bit more in some of these, the areas that we're working in. So to, to share with you, um, as I'm assuming most of you don't know where the Tainer Creek watershed is, um, we are a part of the Kickapoo watershed um, in southwest Wisconsin in the Driftless region. So the, the Tainer Creek um, that drains into the Kickapoo, which drains to the Wisconsin River and then to the Mississippi. So this, so the map on, use my pointer here. So the map here on the left kind of gives you an idea of where the Tainer Creek watershed lies within the whole Kickapoo, which is a Huck 10. And then the Tainer Creek, which is a Huck 12, and this um, aerial imaging show, can kind of show you the composition of the watershed that I work with specifically, which you can see much is wooded, um, there's a lot of water and, and a fair amount, especially at the head of um, farmland. So the projects that um, we work on, um, as I said, are you know all grant funded, and in working with the Tanner Creek um, Farmer Led Watershed Council specifically, we've got a couple really fantastic partners that have um, that collaborate with us and enable us to continue to bring resources and funding opportunities to the farmers. Um, one being the Pasture Project at the Wallace Center. Um, who's really focused on um, grazing and how that affects water quality. So that's that's really nice to have that support. Um, Vernon County Land and Water Conservation, who's much of our implementation partner, um, really helping us, you know, boots on the ground working with the, the Watershed Council. And um, the DATCAP Producer-Led Watershed Program has been um, another large component of funding for the for the watershed group um, just being able to you know offer that funding assistance to to implement a lot of the on-farm actions and events that we we'd like to hold so to share a little bit more in depth with the Tainer Creek farmer led watershed council um, it is it's a farmer led organization established just a little over four years ago in 2016. Um, by, you know, in the first exploratory meeting, there were five farmers. And um, for reference at our meeting that we held last month, we had just under 50. So that's really pretty incredible to have um, that kind of a, of an influx. Um, so a lot of the, what the group really focuses on is connecting um, with each other to share their innovative approaches to conservation and regenerative agriculture. Um, and really, what are their efforts to help protect the soil and water within the watershed? As you know, all farmers know, um, water is the most critical nutrient, whether you're raising livestock or crops. So they have an invested interest in ensuring that the water quality um, maintains well, and in if any case, we can improve it as well. So um, the much of the group is kind of made up of second or third generation farmers and and the primary interests for the group are the health and welfare and future of the watershed you know being comprised of the soil and the water so it's generally a very it's an interesting group it's a dynamic group and very interested in adopting change you can see a couple stats here that kind of share some of the um some of the facts, I guess, in terms of the meetings that we've held, we're generally averaging 20 attendees and 
um, that's starting to trend up. I'm not sure if it's because folks are bored, uh, because there's not very many other opportunities held, or you know if we're genuinely um, increasing interest. But um, we're certainly we're we're trending high. So. Um, but it, it represents a really nice percentage of the watershed, it, which covers about uh, 4,000 acres. So. so this slide here shares with you just one of the presentations that um, we've held on you know, on farm. Um, in October of 2019, we were fortunate to host Gabe Brown, um, which drew about 250 participants. And um, it, it was actually held in the, the picture on the top. You can see that's um, actually held right here on the farm that we live at, so um, in, in our sale barn. So it's, it's really a, a nice opportunity to get folks out on farm and that, um, was a very well received meeting, um, a mixture of landowners and farmers and people interested in, in regenerative practices and, and people just genuinely interested in um, the water and soil quality around them. So how, um, how Valley Stewardship Network serves the Watershed Council is kind of through two more, two kind of specific avenues. Um, one being supporting the on-farm conservation and regenerative practices, really to focus on reduction of erosion, reduction of phosphorus and sediment runoff, um, increasing soil fertility and managing the water and soil quality. Um, the other avenue is um, facilitating the water quality assessments, um, primarily an effort to develop a baseline, just so that we can understand as we continue to practice those regenerative efforts, how they tie back to the, any impact on water quality. So the water quality assessments um, determine, like I, as I just said, kind of determine the impact on the conservation grazing management practices that reduce nutrient and sediment loads in the Tanner Creek watershed. So one of the goals that we have um, through an op you know through an opportunity with the pasture project is to work with the Tanner Creek watershed um, to reduce our phosphorus load and sediment by five percent, um, which totals about the 1,700 pounds of total phos and 940 pounds of or 940 ton of sediment. Um, so the, you know, just kind of generally d looking at that through 550 acres of con of cropland conversion, or 200, two hundred two I'm sorry, 2,860 acres of grazed cover crops. So some of the um, specific regenerative practices that, um, especially myself, support for the Tanner Creek watershed. Um, you know, our, through our technical assistance, we offer consultants that um, work through the whole farm assessments and grazing plans for some of the folks that are pursuing um, funding um, in, in terms of cost share for some of their um, management changes. Um, we do a, we continue to try, even through some of these uncharted times right now, um, to work through meetings and trainings. And what does that look like for our watershed council? And and how do they get the most from some of the speakers? And and um, it's certainly changed from you know hosting some like the 250 people events. Um, and now we're we're really focusing more on um, pasture walks and and taking a look at some of the changes that are occurring on farms. You know, this summer we had um, an opportunity to look at some 30 inch corn and 60 inch corn with covers planted between it, which we're actually fortunately able to circle back to this month and take a look now that the corn's been taken off for silage, how, how do the covers look? And then what are the next steps there, um, both above ground and um, through soil pits? So um, uh, let's see. And then also, what are the other things that some of the producers are looking for? Is it, um, you know, are they benefiting most from some of these, these um, pasture walks where they can work together and kind of discuss solutions collaboratively? Um, or also, are they looking for some 
individual on farm kind of prescriptive suggestions um, tailored to their farm, their soil, their um, livestock production type, you know, and really looking through some of that. So that's kind of what has shifted. And, um, you know, initially, as we looked at how do we manage through events and, and this educational piece, um, it was a little uncertain, you know, through the spring. But now as we're getting to the fall, it's really, um, you know, the producers are really speaking up and they're telling us what they want. And and it's showing, you know, both through attendance and you know, the conversation. Uh, it's a it's very open and encouraging group that ranges from um, young folks just trying to find their place in agriculture to you know, third, fourth, fifth generation farmers, you know, on their parcel of land sharing what they know. Um, and and the beautiful thing is there isn't a single person that really has tried to step out and be that, um, that source of all knowledge. It's a very collaborative effort. Um, so that's you know, a lot of what the sharing producer stories is. Um, and, and just sharing those experiences, both through conversation and also hosting pasture walks. Um, we do have the water quality assessments that we assist in. Um, those, there's well water testing that is that is a process that's driven by the um, Tanner Creek watershed. Uh, they are the ones that are facilitating the collections and transporting the samples, and and really just the that we work through helping to bring in different experts to um, share those results and, and discuss the results. And similarly with surface water testing, um, that is something that we implement, that we, um, that we do the work through Valley Stewardship Network and just to really share and establish those baselines of what, what our surface water looks like through testing in different, different locations throughout the creek. Um, so as I mentioned before, I'm excited for our cover crops to start popping up. And that's a lot of, you know, what we're talking about and supporting um, this, you know, all throughout the year, you know, queuing up the conversation. But right now is it's kind of go time. <laughs> so um, just really looking for folks to to, you know, implement cover crops, keep the keep things growing all year round um, and then also talking a little bit about our native plantings, um, putting in maybe implementing some prairie strips, um, and just generally how can we assist in that um, transition from cropland to pasture and, you know, economically, how does that make sense? And just supporting the whole farm goals and, and long-term plan. So um, all that is done through cost share um, so that, again, that we've been able to secure through those partners. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a, a general overview of what Valley Stewardship Network is, how I work with the group, and then a lot of um, what the Tanner Creek uh, Farmer-Led Watershed Council is doing specifically in terms of, you know, implementing those grazing practices and water practices to um, for long-term management so i'll look forward to your questions afterwards and you can you'll find my contact information on the screen great thank you so much danny and thank you to um, all of our speakers now we can move on to some q a um, we do it looks like we do have some great um, questions in the chat box some of them have already been answered but I'll go ahead and read them all just so that we have them recorded for folks who may be listening afterwards. Um, Sandy, Jessica asks about topography and distance from water bodies definitely being important, but is there a certain soil type that is more suitable for the biosphere? And, and basically, you know, sandy soils are very prone to, you know, blow, uh, wind erosion, things like that. So, I mean, if, if the grasses get denuded, around those you know that that can be prone to erosion and then our clay soils can get compacted um, and you know the bulk density can increase and so then that can get more water erosion on those as well so yeah it's always kind of like that loam soil in the middle is always the best okay great and anthony um ask if there's a few citations you'd recommend for folks looking for some more information on biospheres looks like you recommended an article in Rangeland Ecology and Management? Yep, that was the one that I published that I gave the information from. 
and there's uh, in the in that one there's a discussion that brings up some of the literature on the on the biospheres. Great, thank you. Uh, Jessica has a question for Jean. Um, Jane, she's curious if there's a way to connect new grazers with more experienced grazers on the Midwest Grazing Exchange, or if that match is only for cattle to land. I know you responded and said that that um, program is for cattle and land to land, but there are some other opportunities for connecting beginner farmers to more experienced folks. Yeah, so the Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship is one of those, and um, Laura Payne, who did my favorite slide that I showed during my presentation, uh, was the program coordinator for Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship and helped set a lot of it up. Um, that is a formal apprenticeship program that includes some classroom, or now it would be online, instruction and uh, then pairing a, a wannabe dairy farmer with an experienced dairy grazer to um, do a two-year apprenticeship. So that's a great program. Um, and then there are a bunch of other mentorship opportunities too. Farm Beginnings Program is one of them. Um, yeah, offhand, I, I'm not thinking of other formal ones, but there are all kinds of informal opportunities to, you know, connect up with experienced grazers through field days and Practical Farmers of Iowa is one group that's kind of mastered the art of doing the virtual field day with farmers who tote a camera around with them on their farm and do a voiceover. So, you know, lots of opportunities for farmers to, for beginners to find someone who knows what they're doing and um, have a chance to chat with them. Yeah, great. Thanks for joining. I know those PFI definitely does a great job with those virtual field days, but a lot of other folks are getting into the virtual field day uh, game, so to speak, now that we are doing a lot more things virtually. So I know a lot of extensions have looked into that, et cetera. So um, lots more opportunities around that. Um, Stefan has a great question here, and this is for all three of the speakers, really. So he's curious, are you seeing a lot of interest in practices that Gabe Brown has done on his farm, such as no-till or rotational grazing, et cetera? If so, what do you feel has prevented farmers from pursuing these practices? I can share a little bit about my experience and um, especially since we did host Gabe Brown here within the watershed and, and a lot of how he was interpreted. Um, you know, we've been in an area that has implemented no-till and rotational grazing for a long time. So some of those practices um, weren't questioned at all. You know, just it was really nice to hear some of the supporting you know, facts that he had and just a lot of the numbers that he had compiled and was willing to show through his presentation. Um, so I wouldn't say that there's really been any any pushback in that. And, you know, um, I think when when Gabe presented more about, um, or as he talks a lot about, about carbon, far carbon farming, um, that can be a little bit more of a challenge to get producers to, to grasp you know, it's, it is probably not the most palatable part of the conversation. And um, sometimes this, you know, having folks listen to it for any length of time can be a little challenging. So um, working through some of those um, more technical pieces, and then, um, you know, I, I would say some of the apprehension that has been shared with me from farmers is the, the typical, right, that, well, he doesn't farm in our area. <laughs> and he, he doesn't know what it's like here or there, right. But, um, but on the base concepts and the work that he's doing, it's been very easy to tie a lot of that back. Um, you know, I think he does a nice job um, talking about the general concepts. And then what we found is this following back up with with more local or regional experts that can interpret some of that and put it, helping the farmers put that into practice in, in their own area has been a really nice follow up to Gabe. For us in South Dakota, we've had Gabe, you know, lots of times. And I think, uh, you know, the no-till, the rotational grazing are very easy to adopt. I mean, we have a lot of people that no-till because of, you know, we don't have as much moisture. 
So no-till is a no-brainer. Um, one thing that I would say is was is probably more challenging is to is to actually get to like um, reducing fertilizers, reducing chemicals. That's probably a little bit harder to actually kind of go no-till organic is, is kind of where he's going, and I think that's that's probably the the last part that's really going to be challenging for most people. Yeah, thanks, Sandy, for bringing that up. I think that was also um, generally a kind of a piece of that was pushed back here as well. It's just how do you step down off of some of that chemical program? Yeah, this is Jane, and I would just add that uh, in Minnesota, the Sustainable Farming Association of Minnesota has spearheaded uh, for a number of years now a soil health summit, and they're also a U of M extension push towards soil health and that focus on soil health um, as undergirding all of crop production, whether it's row crops or perennial forage or something else seems to get a little bit of traction with producers. Um, the soil health summit that the Sustainable Farming Association puts on really attracts some of the larger scale cash grain farmers that you don't typically expect to see at um, grazing type events, but they hear a, a lot about grazing during the Soil Health Summit because um, Dave Brown has been there, Alan Williams has been there, uh, Kent Solberg was with SFA until he just um, accepted a consulting position with Alan Williams and Gabe Brown's um, business. So, so that's been that kind of emphasis on soil health has, I think, really helped attract attention from some more conventional farmers. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I know that um, from our end of our work, we've seen that as well, Jane. And and one, you know, silver lining perhaps to. Um, the way our work has been going this year is that this year the Soil Health Summit in Minnesota was virtual. So I know quite a few folks outside of Minnesota were able to attend and um, who knows if that's the case in the future, but something to keep in mind. Great question, Stefan. Um, Jessica has a question for Danny here. Um, have you assisted any producers in establishing a native planting pasture? If so, what are the things to be prepared for while tra traditioning, transitioning from cropland to native pasture? Yeah, good question, Jessica. Um, I'm not entirely certain if you um, mean that you'd like to, you know, the question about transitioning a whole um, pasture to native plants or if just utilizing some of the native plantings um, in a transition from crop ground. But um, what we've done um, more, and mostly, you know, honestly, it's cost prohibitive because native seed can um, be you know, very costly, but you typically what we've done is transition um, maybe some highly erodible areas or um, strips of along the edge of crop fields into some of these native plantings, you know, to help stabilize the ground and reduce um, erosion and manage runoff. Now, um, we do have some producers that we're working with that um, have just started to graze and have the intention of grazing them. So, um, the, you know, from our standpoint, it's just looking at the seed mixture and how how the native plants will be utilized. Um, but also just, I guess, the one piece of advice, and, and because it's not necessarily some place, an aspect I work very closely in, but I do collaborate with, with our expert in that area, but just having patience and understanding the, the slow process that it, it is to get some of those native plants established and um, and that the, the native planting will look very different over the course of the first three years before it's really able to be grazed. So that's, I guess, is some of it that I've, um, I've gathered and, you know, can share with our experiences. Sure. Thanks so much, Danny. Um, it looks like Mike has a question here, um, maybe specifically about cover crops. So we have a, a few places we could point them, but I'd love to hear what y'all think. Um, he's curious if there's any additional information about cover crop 36 and 30 inch and 60 inch corn. And if so, where could that be fine? And I see uh, Jane just posted a link to uh, PFI. 
Um, I'm sure there are other resources out there. Um, anything else you can point Mike towards, folks? I just have a, a little bit of feedback that um, working with producers that have implemented that um, typically, and as as all of you know who work with producers, you you tend to get a pretty nonchalant response that I don't know, I'm just trying it. <laughs> so it is nice that Jean um, posted a couple of of good research pieces that show the differences and the benefits, um, because in, you know typically you know especially this example that we're looking at here again this month is that you know it's it's um, very exploratory, but it's you know from a producer that wants to push push the edges and see what's possible because he recognizes the value of of managing that that erodible ground and um, just keeping green cover on that and something alive. So um, I look forward also to reading some of you know those links that Jane sent. Great. Thanks, Danny. And I know, Jane, you also had a link, which is what my first thought is with the Midwest Cover Council on some of their resources. Any other comments on that quickly here before we uh, close out? Oops, look like we have one more question for our group here before we um, and for today, um, Stefan is curious, what are some of the best resources for silvopasture? Uh, hi, this is Jane, and I'm not going to have time to look up the links and put them in before we're out of time, but I would say that um, the Savannah Institute based in Wisconsin is a very good resource. Uh, the Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri has a silvopasture component and the Sustainable Farming Association of Minnesota has a silvopasture initiative and has a staff person hired as the lead on silvopasture. Oh, Aaron Meyer just popped that link in. Thanks, Aaron. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Well, our presenters' uh, email addresses are listed here on the screen if you'd like to reach out to them with specific information regarding their presentation today. But we appreciate each of them taking the time to join us. Um, and we hope you'll be in touch regarding um, future editions of The Current, uh, which take, plus, uh, take place the second Wednesday of the month at 2 p.m. Central. Um, and this recording, as a reminder, will be posted on our website, North water.org as well as at learn.extension.edu. So thank you all for joining us today and special thanks for our speakers for a great uh, conversation and great discussion.